Wisdom of the Middle Way. Nagarjuna's Mulamadhyaya Makarika. Translation and Commentary by J. L. Garfield. Chapter 6, Examination of Desire and the Desirous. This chapter represents a continuation of the discussion begun in the previous one. That is, while the chapter is nominally about desire, an example chosen for its obvious soteriological significance, it is in a larger sense a further discussion of the relation between entities and their properties, with specific attention to the relation between human beings and their psychological characteristics. Locating the discussion at this point is consonant with a tradition of Mahayana discussions of emptiness in which one first addresses external phenomena, which are both easier to analyze and less susceptible of reification than the self, and then generalizes the discussion to human psychological phenomena. The chapter opens with an echo of the discussion of space. 1. If prior to desire. And without desire there were a desirous one, desire would depend on him. Desire would exist when there is a desirous one. One possibility for the relationship between the subject of desire and the desire is that the desirous one exists qua desirous one independently of the desire, which is then adventitious and dependent. That is, on this view the desirous one is inherently desirous, but the desire is merely dependent. This, however, is problematic, for then there is a real contrast in the mode of existence of the desirous one and the desire, the desirous one truly exists, but the desire does not truly exist. But if there is no real desire, in virtue of what is there a desirous one? 2. Were there no desirous one, moreover, where would desire occur? Whether or not desire or the desirous one exist? The analysis would be the same. But if there is no desirous one, there is no ontological basis for the desire. So whether we posit an inherently existent desirous one or no desirous one. At all, we cannot identify desire as existing. And, of course, this goes for any characteristic or psychological attribute and for any subject of any such attribute identified under any description. Moreover, the converse is also true, whether or not we posit inherently existent desire, we cannot thereby establish the existence of a substantially existent desirous one. If the desire does not exist inherently but only dependently, that dependence in no way presupposes an independent basis. If on the other hand desire is posited as inherently existent, there would be no need for a basis in a desirous one at all. In neither case would the substantial existence of the entity in question, subject, or attitude, have any import for the reality of the correlative entity, attitude or subject. And the reason for this is simply that inherent existence is not relational existence. Since desire and the desirous one must be understood as interrelated, they must be understood as mutually dependent. 3. Desire and the desirous one cannot arise together. In that case, desire and the desirous one would not be mutually contingent. Another possibility the opponent might suggest is this, desire and the desirous one come into inherent existence at the same time. It is very important in following this argument to remember Nagarjuna's dialectical task. The opponent against whom his reductios are aimed is one who attributes inherent existence either to the desirous one, to desire, or both. Nagarjuna is only attempting to show that attributing to them that kind of existence is incoherent not that there is no desire and that there are no desirous people at all. That would be crazy. Fundamental to the Buddhist conception of the predicament of human existence is the centrality of craving to the arising of suffering. But also fundamental is the conviction that there can be a release from craving. That is only possible. However, if craving is dependently originated since only then could the conditions that determine its arising be eliminated. So it is critically important from a Buddhist perspective to come to a complete understanding of the nature of desire, and the mode of its existence, and it would be inconceivable to deny its existence completely. But Nagarjuna is emphasizing here that that Understanding must reveal them as mutually dependent in order to avoid the absurd conclusion that either could exist without the other. That precludes the assertion that while they in fact always co-occur, that co-occurrence is not through interdependence, but through contingent simultaneity of independent phenomena. Nagarjuna's claim in 6.3 is also the conclusion of the argument that is about to follow. 
it proceeds by means of a destructive dilemma. Given that the opponent must have desire and the desirous one arising simultaneously, they must be either identical or different. Nagarjuna will show that neither alternative is coherent, 6, for spells out this strategy. 4. In identity there is no simultaneity. A thing is not simultaneous with itself. But if there is difference, then how would there be simultaneity? In the first line of this verse, Nagarjuna points out the relational character of simultaneity. If simultaneity is predicated, it must be predicated of two distinct things that arise at the same time. We don't say that a thing arises simultaneously with itself. But if things are completely distinct in nature, they cannot co-occur in the same place, that is, if desire and the desirous one had distinct essences, they could not be in the same place at the same time. 5. If in identity there were simultaneity, then it could occur without association. If in difference there were simultaneity, it could occur without association. The first claim is meant to be a reductio on the view that simultaneous things can be identical. For suppose that there was an apparent pair of events whose simultaneity was in question, say William Clinton's uttering of the oath of office of the presidency and the inauguration of the first. 